Good morning, everybody. Uh, at least uh, good morning here from the West Coast. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I am Luke Evnen. I am the chairman of the Scleroderma Research Foundation, um, the board of directors. Today, I am just honored to be able to introduce um, one of the Scleroderma Research Foundation funded investigators, Dr. Andrew Tager, who joins us from Massachusetts. Um, this is the eighth in our webinar series, and all of our previous presentations can be viewed on our website at scleroderma.research.org. Please do visit us online. We have a growing library of information, all of it freely accessible, uh, so that you can better be informed about what's happening in scleroderma research and across the scleroderma community. And um, it's very important to us that we're delivering the content that you, the content that you want and need. So please. Um, once you do uh, get online for our library, send us your thoughts uh, via email or by calling the office. Of course, we always appreciate your support. As we say uh, every time we get on board here, the SRF relies exclusively on donations and sponsorships to speed progress toward a cure. So please consider helping us here at the end of the year in this holiday season. 100% of every gift received through December 31st will be allocated exclusively to medical research. Today's webinar is made possible by generous grants from Novartis, Gilead Sciences, and Metamune. It will focus on clinical trials, advancing patient care, and the vital role that medical research plays in the process. We're scheduled for one hour together, and this will include a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Questions can be asked by using the chat box in the conference window. But please remember that our webinars are for general information only, and no information provided is to be considered personalized medical advice. We will not be able to answer questions pertaining to personal symptoms. It's great to have you with us, and, my, and it is my pleasure to introduce a very talented physician and scientist who is dedicated to helping scleroderma patients like you and me. Dr. Andrew Tager is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School with appointments in the Center for Immunology and Inflammatory Diseases, as well as the Pulmonary and Critical Care Unit of the Mass General Hospital. He is also co-director of Mass General's Interstitial Lung Disease Clinic, which focuses on patients with lung fibrosis, including, of course, those with scleroderma. Dr. Tager received his MD from Harvard Medical School and completed both his internal medicine residency as well as his pulmonary and critical care medicine fellowship at Mass General. As an SRF-funded investigator, Dr. Tager is focused on identifying chemicals produced by the body that promote the development of fibrosis. Most importantly, his work aims to find ways to inhibit such molecules to prevent the progression of fibrotic diseases and promote the healing of scarred organs. Dr. Tager is uniquely qualified for today's webinar, and it is an honor to introduce him today as he presents new directions for scleroderma treatments, understanding the basis for current clinical trials. Andy, please. Well, thank you very much, Luke, for that uh, really kind and lovely introduction and for the opportunity to uh, uh, present a webinar today. Um, and uh, good, actually, good afternoon uh, to everyone on the East Coast, and good morning to everyone on the West Coast, and, and lunchtime for people in between. Um, so, uh, as Luke described, uh, what I would like to focus on uh, for this webinar is really um, the connections between uh, basic research uh, that is funded by the Scleroderma Research Foundation and other organizations such as the National Institute of Health and how that gets translated into clinical trials uh, that you or friends or family members uh, may be asked to participate in or may have the opportunity to participate in. And I'd like to talk about that uh, process to sort of describe um, uh, how a potential therapy moves from one uh, stage of development to another, and then also uh, talk about what the current trials are that have moved from the research lab uh, now uh, into currently enrolling uh, clinical trials for scleroderma. So that will be the, the gist of the, uh, the webinar. Um, and then uh, to just highlight the 
uh, three things that I'd like to cover in this overview of the talk. Uh, I'd like to start out again just generally speaking about uh, clinical trials. Uh, what are they? Uh, how do they work? Uh, why do we do them? Why might it be a good idea for uh, you or loved ones uh, to participate in them? Um, then to step back and talk about the current state of knowledge of uh, the, uh, what causes scleroderma and how advances in that knowledge uh, from basic research funded by the SRF and other organizations uh, is now about or is becoming translated to the clinic to promising new therapies for patients. Um, so those will be the three major areas to touch on. So to move into the first area, what is a clinical trial? Um, clinical trials, just like uh, lab science, are research, uh, except uh, instead of working with cells or animal models, they're actually research done with human participants, human volunteers. Uh, the goal is to uh, add to medical knowledge uh, to help understand and treat diseases, in our case, of course, scleroderma. Um, so. Uh, basically, the structure of the clinical trials that I'm going to be talking about today uh, are basically evaluating potential new drug therapies or other therapies for scleroderma, and they can either be compared to uh, standard therapies that may already be available, and an example of that in our field is the um, new uh, scleroderma lung trial, which is comparing cyclophosphamide, which has already been shown to uh, be helpful for lung fibrosis and scleroderma, to a newer drug uh, called Celsept. So that is basically a new drug being compared to one that's already available uh, or already standardly used for a certain reason. And the other is new drugs that, that uh, have not been used in, in patients before. In that case, they're rather than compared to standard drugs, they're compared to placebos, which are basically um, pills or other treatments that have no active ingredients. The trials fundamentally have two goals. Um, they're designed initially to determine whether these new drugs are safe to give to people um, because, as you can imagine, as something comes out of a research lab and gets tested in animals, at some point it's got to be tried in humans if it looks good. And the very first concern is just to make sure that's not going to harm people. Um, once things are shown to be safe, we can then determine whether they're actually effective, uh, whether uh, they can um, uh, improve the quality of life uh, of patients with scleroderma and hopefully uh, some point in the not too distant future actually cure patients with scleroderma. The goals of the trial uh, depend on, there are different types of trials uh, which uh, we refer to as phases of trials. Um, that uh, depend on where the drug is in its development, and the goals differ uh, as a, a particular drug progresses from a phase one to a phase two to a phase three trial. So the, the phase one, two, and three are done sequentially for a given drug. Uh, if it passes its phase one, it can move on to a phase two. If it doesn't pass phase one, it basically stops there. Uh, and the same with going from phase two to phase three. Um, Phase one trials are basically the first time the drug has been given to human patients. So there's been, as we'll talk about, there's been a lot of research in the laboratory and in animal studies to show that it's effective and safe to give to animals. But again, at some point, it needs to, for the first time, be given to humans. Um, and so the purpose of the phase one trial is really, is the drug safe? Uh, in that it doesn't harm people, is it tolerable, in that it doesn't really cause terrible side effects that uh, although transient may be so debilitating that it's just not worth it. Uh, and also for the uh, uh, metabolism of the drug, again, since it's never been given in humans, uh, to figure out if it needs to be given once a day, twice a day, three times a day. Um, uh, there is obviously work done in animals to predict that, but there's no substitute for actually checking in humans. Um, those tend to be small trials, and sometimes they're done in scleroderma patients. Uh, often they're done in healthy volunteers, again, because the question is, isn't at all whether that's going to help in scleroderma. It's simply, is it safe to give to people? Uh, so whether 
you're a scleroderma patient or you're a healthy volunteer, that information can be gleaned from either uh, type. If the drug is determined to be safe in a phase one trial, it, and then starts to see whether it has effectiveness, like it had in animal models, is it effective in humans? So now, because we want to look at the effectiveness of the drug, we're, uh, of course, going to use scleroderma patients rather than healthy volunteers, because the idea is, is that helping uh, what we're going to focus on today, the fibrosis of scleroderma. So uh, the difference is that tends to be larger number of patients, uh, and again, all patients uh, with an RK scleroderma. If there's evidence that there is, uh, the drug has some effect, uh, that it uh, uh, causes regression of the skin fibrosis or of the lung fibrosis, then it moves into a phase three trial, uh, which is a much larger trial. Uh, it's now uh, going to be what we call randomized. So when you enter the trial, if you enter the trial or if your loved one or friend enters the trial, they'll be randomized uh, to either the new drug or placebo. Um, and neither the patient nor the physician will know what uh, is being given, whether a patient gets randomized to the drug treatment arm or randomized to the placebo arm. Um, and that's really now we really want to know, um, is this uh, drug better than um, not taking anything at all? And I'll show you some indications for why we really need to go to that formal randomization process where patients are blinded to what they're getting and physicians are blinded to what they're getting. And these have, need to be larger trials, uh, again, so we can uh, really make a con uh, firm conclusion about whether the drug uh, is effective or not. So I'm, uh, as Luke mentioned, uh, m although uh, my research focuses on scleroderma, uh, clinically I see uh, all patients with what we call interstitial lung disease or lung fibrosis, and that includes patients with scleroderma and lung fibrosis, and also a type of lung fibrosis called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF. Uh, and that's another, like scleroderma, another uh, disease where uh, there's scarring produced and for which we have no effective treatments. Um, now, I'm going to give two examples of why it's so important to do these formal trials uh, with randomization, blinding, et cetera. Uh, the, the, the first thing is, you know, so all these drugs are coming out of the lab. They've been tested in animals. We, we, we think they're going to be effective. Um, there's a lot of reasons for them to be effective, but until we test them in humans, we really just don't know. And I think one example of how much we don't know sometimes until we actually do the trials was this trial uh, of a combination of anti-inflammatory therapy uh, in this disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, this was therapy that had been given to patients by physicians, including myself, uh, for several decades with the presumption we didn't think it was dramatically effective, but we thought it, at least in some patients, would be somewhat effective, and we certainly didn't think it would be harmful, um, or else, of course, we wouldn't have prescribed it. Um, because it was just uh, kind of taken as conventional wisdom that these medicines would be helpful, it hadn't been ever subje subjected to one of these randomized controlled trials. And the NIH and a group of investigators finally decided, gee, we really need to do a randomized clinical trial of this treatment. And it ended up being very good that uh, we did, not because it was shown to be effective, but actually it was shown to be harmful. So the graph I have uh, in this slide is basically the probability of dying comparing the patients that got this therapy to patients that got placebo. And the trial was actually stopped early because it was found that the patients who were getting the therapy were more likely to die, were dying more quickly than the patients who got placebo. So this was a therapy that we you know, had been giving to patients for a long time and was harmful. So again, until we really do a, a sophisticated randomized trial, we just don't know the answer. So that's on the downside why we want to make sure we 
assess things before we give them to a broad patient population, make sure we're not harming people. On the next slide, I have another trial. Again, this is from the pulmonary fibrosis uh, field um, of a new drug uh, made by one of the pharmaceutical companies, Boringer Ingelheim. Um, it doesn't have a name yet, so BI is Boringer Ingelheim. Um, and this was a drug uh, that was given to patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And what the graph, the bar graph is showing is how much their lung function declined um, over the course of a year while they were getting either placebo on the left or increasing doses of this new drug, again, never been given to fibrosis patients before, uh, uh, progressively increasing doses going along uh, on the right. Um, so low dose, higher dose, higher dose, highest dose. And again, the bigger the bar, the more the lung function declined. So these patients were doing worse. So if you didn't give them anything with pulmonary fibrosis, they all got worse. On the other hand, as you gave them higher doses of drug, that amount of decline decreased to where at the highest dose, uh, there were, this was really not statistically significant in terms of a decline. So it really looked like this drug actually works in preventing the progression of pulmonary fibrosis and keeps the patients that were on the high dose stable. Um, and now this was a phase two trial. It's now going to a phase three trial just of this dose that appeared to be effective. So uh, we can hopefully identify drugs that actually do work. So again, but it, unless we do these randomized clinical trials, we just don't know. Now, what I've shown is a couple of, of trials for pulmonary fibrosis with uh, what was evaluated in the first trial was death. Uh, in the second trial, a measure of lung function, how much patients uh, could blow out, how, what's the volume of breath they could blow out. Um, what we look at in our scleroderma trials are slightly different. And again, what I'm going to focus on, there are trials for pulmonary hypertension and scleroderma trials for pulmonary fibrosis. I'm going to focus on trials of the skin fibrosis in scleroderma. Um, and there, the endpoints are different. Uh, for the phase one trial, the endpoint still is going to be safety, and we're going to look at how frequently adverse events occur. And these can be serious life uh, adverse events, the most serious, of course, being death, uh, but also things that are much more mild, like headache, uh, nausea, and so forth. So really anything, uh, whether it's related to the drug or not, anything that uh, would uh, potentially be a problem for patients taking the drug. So that, that's monitored in terms of safety. For effectiveness, there are, since we're looking at the skin, there are skin-specific measures, and then there are systemic measures of, of the whole patient. The two skin-specific measures that are uh, most frequently used now, uh, the one that is most frequently used uh, uh, most of all is the modified Rodnan skin score. And for those of you with scleroderma, your rheumatologist may well have uh, checked this, but basically they uh, try and indent the skin at 17 different sites uh, over your body and rate the stiffness from zero to four and basically add those numbers up. Um, and that actually ends up being quite a reproducible measurement of skin stiffness. Um, work that I'll talk about later supported by the Scleroderma Research Foundation has really been looking at uh, the, what are the genes that are expressed, meaning what are the proteins that are present in the fibrotic skin compared to the normal skin or the skin of normal uh, individuals uh, that might be driving fibrosis and people, are, trials are now starting to actually buy skin biopsy, do skin biopsies before and after drug treatment and see if the type and amount of proteins uh, present in the skin biopsy uh, move from things that drive fibrosis to things that look more normal. Um, systematically, uh, patients in trials are often give, given questionnaires on their quality of life, which uh, will go through a whole range of things in terms of like their day-to-day -day activities and see whether that uh, is getting better. And then we are also very interested in seeing if there are blood tests that can uh, correlate with the severity and the progression of scleroderma and seeing if we can basically see whether a drug is going to work or not based on blood tests. So you could imagine it may take several months 
or even years for skin fibrosis or lung fibrosis to resolve. And it would be awfully nice if we could say a month or two into the trial, it looks like this drug is working or it looks like this drug isn't working. And so there's a lot of effort to identify uh, molecules we call biomarkers, which are things that we can measure in the blood to try and tell us how severe a patient's scleroderma is or how rapidly it's progressing. And uh, investigators have identified a combination of four proteins uh, in the blood, this four gene biomarker, as it's called, that seems to predict uh, how severe uh, uh, scleroderma is and how likely it is to progress. And that's also being evaluated as an endpoint. So that's the phases and the endpoints of clinical trials. So let's now move into uh, how a drug go, goes from someone's idea to a clinical trial. So I'm going to use an example uh, that um, has come uh, from some great interactions I've had with the Scleroderma Foundation, uh, Scleroderma Research Foundation, on uh, uh, something we've done in our lab that's now moving into clinical trials. Um, so basically, uh, investigators apply to funding agencies. They have an idea. They say, I think we should look at X, Y, or Z. Um, research is expensive to do. Uh, so they apply uh, to funding agencies, uh, such as, again, the Scleroderma Research Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, uh, for grant funding to do the experiments. Um, those researchers typically reside at academic institutions, but not always. Um, and in our case, we're here at the MGH. And our role is to try and identify, as Luke said in the introduction, molecules or chemicals present in the body that we think are responsible for driving the fibrosis, uh, such that if we could inhibit them, if a drug company could make a drug to inhibit them, uh, we think that would help scleroderma patients. So with this research funding, we actually were successful in identifying uh, a drug. The drug goes by um, an uh, abbreviation called LPA1, um, that in the mouse models of scleroderma uh, seem to be really critically important. If the mice didn't have this target, this protein, uh, they were completely protected from uh, scleroderma. Um, so that looked to us like that would be a great what we call a target, meaning if a drug could hit that target, we would think that um, uh, uh, would help uh, patients with scleroderma. So we're biologists and we figure out these targets, but we're not, uh, our expertise isn't in medicinal chemistry. That often really resides in the drug companies. Uh, and in this case, uh, Sanofi, one of the largest drug companies, uh, saw results that looked like this target looked very promising in scleroderma. Um, and they basically had their chemists make a drug, make a molecule, a compound, that would inhibit this protein that we identified. So we identified the target, they made the drug. Um, now, once a drug uh, exists, the pharmaceutical company has a drug, uh, it looks good in animal models, so it looks like in animals it works. It looks safe in animals um, uh, in terms of the, just the toxicity studies its drug is done. Then uh, basically the drug company applies to the Food and Drug Administration. Um, they apply for permission to give that drug to humans. And the FDA, again, wants to make sure they've done their homework, their due diligence to say that this looks like it has a good shot at being effective um, and that uh, it looks safe in animals. And if that, they've met that bar, um, then the FDA says, yes, you have approval to try this in humans. And then the drug company sets up a clinical trial, comes full circle back to the hospitals uh, that identified the targets. And that's just what's happened here. Uh, for this case, which I'll talk about. Um, so what I'd like to then move on to uh, is to focus more uh, on the current state of target discovery in our lab and other labs funded by the Scleroderma Research Foundation and, and elsewhere in terms of 
what we ne what we now think is driving fibrosis and scleroderma, and what uh, things such as LPA1 might be good things for the drug companies to make drugs against, and when they do that, what would be good to try in clinical trials. Um, so just to take a step way back, when we're talking about fibrosis for for patients with scleroderma or people who have loved ones or friends with scleroderma, you know that. Fibrosis basically means scarring of a tissue, and where normal tissues are thin and flexible, uh, scarred tissues become thick and stiff, and this is certainly the case uh, in scleroderma in the skin where it's involved, but also in the internal organs in the lung uh, and other places where it's involved. Uh, and the question becomes, what do we think is driving that fibrosis, and what could we, how could we interrupt that relentless progression? Um, so this is a schematic uh, of uh, four areas that we think are really important where we could potentially intervene. We think, as I'll talk about, uh, a combination of the effects of a patient's genes and their environment uh, working, interacting together is required to produce scleroderma. Um, and the way it produces scleroderma is initially it injures patients' blood vessels. And that injury, as well as the uh, environmental uh, triggers themselves, cause the patient's immune system uh, to attack itself. Normally, we have our immune system to attack invading bacteria and viruses. And in this case, uh, the immune system uh, goes awry and actually uh, goes back this way and makes the vascular injury worse both of these together, and I'm going to talk about each one of these steps in detail, uh, leads to the fibrosis, which results from actually the cells that cause fibrosis are cells called fibroblasts. They become activated and lay down collagen and other uh, uh, proteins that cause the skin uh, to become increasingly stiff or organs to become increasingly stiff. So I'm going to go through those four areas one at a time. We're going to start off with uh, the triggers or the ultimate producers of scleroderma in terms of genes and environment. So like many complex diseases, we think scleroderma is what we call a gene by environment disease. And what we mean by that is that in most cases, neither the person's genes they inherit or the environmental exposures that they have are solely responsible for producing scleroderma. Rather, in most cases, uh, most cases scleroderma occur, people inherit a predisposition or a sensitivity to certain environmental risk factors. And when they're exposed to those risk factors, then they develop scleroderma. I'm going to give a couple of examples to, to explain that better. So one example of the role of genetic predisposition, uh, it was found in the 90s there was a population of Choctaw Native Americans in Oklahoma. Um, most of the Choctaw live in Mississippi. There's a population in Oklahoma. And the Choctaw Native Americans in Oklahoma were 20 times more likely than the general population to develop scleroderma. Interestingly, the Choctaw in Mississippi were not more likely to get scleroderma, and the people who lived next door to the Choctaw in Oklahoma were not more likely. So it seemed that it wasn't just the environment in Oklahoma, moving to Oklahoma, that made the Choctaw get scleroderma. And it was found that when they looked at all the cases of scleroderma in that Choctaw population in Oklahoma, they all traced back to the same five families. So basically, these five families had a mutation where there was uh, increased risk for scleroderma, and that was passed on when that, those five families moved to Oklahoma. There was a lot of uh, breeding amongst the families, and that mutation was passed along and uh, became so common in that whole now uh, population of Mississippi. So that was a clear example where this genetic predisposition in this one particular population really led to an increased incidence of scleroderma. On the other hand, there have been clusters of scleroderma uh, in uh, groups of people, unrelated, living in the same place. And there's actually one next door to us here in uh, Charlestown uh, section of uh, 
Boston, actually in Southie or South Boston, uh, the number of scleroderma cases are two to four times higher than expected. Um, and these are in unrelated people, so it doesn't seem to be from a genetic predisposition. It seems to be some exposure that the CDC is investigating but hasn't figured out yet, some exposure that these, patient, these people in South Boston are being exposed to that's uh, increasing uh, their chances of getting scleroderma. So again, we think both genes and environment working together cause scleroderma. Now, we can get ideas for targets for new scleroderma therapies uh, from studying these populations where there's high incidence of, uh, of scleroderma. And one tremendous example uh, of how a study of a population with a genetic predisposition came uh, from work uh, by a really brilliant uh, researcher named Hal Dietz at Johns Hopkins in work that the Scleroderma Research Foundation, Foundation has funded. And he has been investigating a, a congenital or a, a familial form of scleroderma that uh, is caused at birth, and it's known what the mutation is that causes this form called stiff skin syndrome. It's named because the skin, like in scleroderma, becomes fibrotic. Um, and they identified, Dr. Dietz's laboratory identified the gene that's uh, mutated in these families. Uh, it's a gene called fibrillin-1. Now, they studied the, the protein, uh, fibrillin-1. They studied all the mutations in all the families with uh, stiff skin syndrome. And they found that all the mutations that caused this disease were in one portion of the protein that involved its interaction with another type of protein called an integrin. Um, and that led them to realize that one of these integrins was really behaving as a bad actor, an integrin called beta-3. Um, and if they blocked that integrin in the mouse models of scleroderma and, and stiff skin syndrome, they protected against fibrosis. So now this integrin beta-3 is a really exciting target, meaning if drug companies could design a drug that inhibited that molecule, that might not only help these patients with uh, stiff skin syndrome, which is a rare congenital version, but it may help scleroderma, all scleroderma patients or at least many scleroderma patients. So that's an example where intense study of a small population that's genetically predisposed to scleroderma led to the identification of a target that a drug company may now be able to use to help scleroderma broadly. Uh, the next area I'd like to talk about is moving from genes and environment. Again, we think the initial injury that the, these environmental exposures are triggering is to the blood vessels or the vasculature. Um, and why do we think that? Well, the earliest uh, manifestations of scleroderma affect the blood vessels. So for those of you with scleroderma, many of you, you may have had uh, what we call Raynaud's phenomenon, which is basically a, a spasm of the blood vessels that leads to a painful uh, uh, change in colors of the hands as uh, they're deprived of blood flow. And that often occurs several years before overt fibrosis develops. And uh, for those of you with scleroderma, you may also, your rheumatologist may have looked at the capillaries in your uh, uh, fingernails, and those can also become abnormal very early in disease. So we think the first target of these environmental exposures are the blood vessels. Um, and again, the reason being, the reason we think that is that that seems to be the part of the body that's very first affected. We think the injury to the blood vessels frequently stimulates the immune system to attack itself or cause what we call autoimmunity, which is immune responses against the self. Um, and we think that also, besides contributing to vascular complications, such as digital ulcers, uh, also contributes to the fibrosis. So one, one target uh, that's come out of study of blood vessels um, has been a molecule called endothelin-1. This is a molecule that the blood vessels make when they're damaged, whether it's loss of oxygen or uh, what we call shear stress, which is basically physical forces of blood flow on the blood vessel. It makes the vessels uh, make endothelin-1. 
uh, and we think that uh, contributes to the formation of digital ulcers in scleroderma. Um, so uh, we have a good drug to inhibit the effects of endothelin. It's called bosentan. Um, it inhibits actually the receptor or molecule that recognizes endothelin. And there was one of these phase three multicenter randomized placebo-controlled trials in patients with digital ulcers. Uh, and basically the patients who randomized to the bosentin arm had significant decreases in the number of new ulcers that they developed. So these were patients that were all uh, had scleroderma that, and not only just, uh, you know, uh, a scleroderma that had already caused finger uh, or toe ulcers. Um, and the ones that got bosentin, the n number of new ulcers significantly declined. And there may be some suggestion that the skin fibrosis got better as well. That's an open question. So after the blood vessels are injured, uh, we have uh, immune attack of the body. And there, the immune system is made up uh, of a number of different cells. Uh, two or three of the most relevant cell types uh, are called B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, and monocytes. Um, and we think they may all contribute uh, to scleroderma. The uh, most uh, obvious manifestation of autoimmunity in scleroderma is the development of what we call autoantibodies or antibodies uh, which the immune system makes. Usually again they recognize influenza or they recognize the bacteria, but in this case uh, they recognize uh, proteins in the patient's own bodies and in the vast, vast majority of scleroderma patients there are these autoantibodies present. Um, we often use them to diagnose scleroderma. There's an uh, antibody test called SCL70 uh, that uh, is quite specific uh, uh, for scleroderma. Not all scleroderma patients have it, but if you have it, uh, you're very likely to have scleroderma. And not only are they valuable diagnostically, but we do think that they contribute uh, to the fibrosis itself. Uh, there may be antibodies that develop to blood vessels that can actually injure the blood vessels uh, and promote the vascular injury. Antibodies that can develop to fibroblasts that may, these are the cells that make the fibrosis, make the collagen that can actually activate them and drive the fibrosis forward. Uh, T cells or T lymphocytes, uh, in, if you look in uh, the blood, or the skin or other fibrotic tissues uh, in scleroderma patients, there are a lot of these T cells present. And not only are they just present, they are clearly, they've been activated. And they make molecules uh, called cytokines. These are molecules that talk to other cells, um, like endothelial cells or fibroblasts, that also promote uh, uh, fibrosis as also the same for monocytes, macrophages. So the immune system in some way is orchestra or, or, or the, the, um, the conductor of the orchestra. It makes a lot of these signals that tell other cells what to do. Um, and uh, again, how they tell cells uh, uh, what to do are by elaborating these proteins uh, called cytokines. And I've just uh, identified three of them here that are currently being tried in clinical trials, IL-6, IL-1, and uh, B cell activating factor, BAF. Um, and this basically, uh, there are now clinical trials uh, targeting each of these cytokines. There's an antibody called tocilizumab that's in uh, trials for scleroderma. It inhibits uh, the receptor of IL-6. Uh, there is a, a drug that inhibits IL-1 uh, in the blood, uh, soaks it up, uh, that's in trials for scleroderma. And there's an antibody against BAF that's uh, in trials. So you can, one strategy is to pick out the cytokines, the molecules that the immune system makes uh, that drives fibrosis, and try and pick them off one by one. Uh, another strategy, sort of 
going from the entire opposite direction is to say there are many abnormalities in the immune system uh, in scleroderma um, that may be the result of many environmental exposures. So perhaps we could reset the entire immune system. And one way to do that is actually to have the patient undergo uh, what we call a hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplant. It used to be called the bone marrow transplant. Uh, the bone marrow is a source of hematopoietic stem cells, but not the only source. So now the broader term is hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplant. So just to go through some of the trials that are actually now uh, recruiting patients. Um, uh, Rilanocept uh, is an IL-1 inhibitor. Uh, it's currently in a phase two trial, uh, which is randomized, double-blinded, and placebo-controlled. Uh, it's for patients with diffuse scleroderma that has to be somewhat severe by the mod modified Rodin skin score. Uh, the p way that people are going to judge whether it works or not uh, is to see whether it changes uh, that four-gene biomarker in the plasma. Um, and again, with these biomarker studies, what we hope is we can get a read on whether it's working or not very quickly. And this trial, basically, you get treatment for six weeks uh, and see whether you're, uh, by the blood tests, it looks like it's having a positive effect. Tocilizumab is the antibody to the IL-6 receptor. Um, it's now in a phase 2 th 3 trial, also multicenter, randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled. Same uh, inclusion criteria, diffuse scleroderma with the modified Rodin skin score of 15 or better. Um, it's, uh, because it's phase 2 and 3, they're both safety and effectiveness endpoints. Uh, and interestingly, in this trial, uh, sometimes patients are, one of the, some of the reluctance to go into a trial is the fact that you may get randomized to the placebo. That's, in, as I've explained in the beginning, that's incredibly important for medical knowledge, but if the drug is effective, may not help you that much. So in this case, um, it's a two-year uh, study, and in the first year, uh, uh, you're randomized to placebo or tocilizumab, but in the second year, everybody gets tocilizumab. Um, so uh, it allows for uh, uh, everybody to potentially benefit uh, from the uh, new treatment, which is a novel way, I think, to do, uh, and a good way to do uh, these clinical trials. Um, and the, the, the last of these anti-cytokine trials uh, is uh, an antibody called belumumab uh, that hits BAF. Uh, that's a phase two trial, um, also for diffuse scleroderma. Uh, this is uh, uh, using modified Rodin skin score as the endpoint. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, you want to potentially uh, roll in treatments that might be effective. In this trial, everyone gets Celsept, uh, mycophenolate, and then half the patients get uh, mycophenolate plus the uh, belumumab, and half the patients get uh, mycophenolate and placebo. Uh, the, la the second strategy I talked about, rather than hitting individual cytokines, trying to reset the whole uh, immune system. There have been a number of trials uh, that have started and actually some that have finished recruitment, uh, including the Scott trial. Uh, when you have these transplants, uh, you can either get the stem cells from the patient themselves, in which case they're called autotransplants or autologous transplants, or from uh, siblings uh, or other relatives that have similar immune systems. Those are called allo or allogeneic transplants. Um, the two big uh, auto transplant trials, SCOT, which is scleroderma, cyclophosphamide or transplant, and uh, ASTIS, autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, in both of them, patients got randomized to either high-dose cyclophosphamide or to the stem cell transplant. Um, and again, the recruitment's finished. The uh, early data looks quite encouraging for regression of fibrosis. Um, but again, the, the, the trials, the data hasn't matured yet. Um, allogeneic uh, transplants are potentially even more effective, but also potentially uh, have, are much more complicated and right now are reserved for patients with very severe scleroderma uh, at high risk for dying from their scleroderma. This includes patients who have had an autologous transplant that have progressed uh, despite that. 
Okay, we're running a little short of time, so I'd like to uh, speed along to the uh, ultimate outcome here, uh, which is fibrosis. And as I mentioned, uh, we think fibrosis is driven uh, by these cells called uh, fibroblasts. Um, these are the cells that make the collagen, that make the proteins that cause the tissue to become stiff. Um, in scleroderma, uh, the number of these cells increase and they also become activated and take on a different form uh, into a cell we call a myofibroblast. Those cells seem to really be the business cells of this disease. They're ones that make an awful lot of collagen. Um, and if you look in biopsies of skin of patients with scleroderma, and you, the most affected areas will have the most of these myofibroblasts, the number of these cells correlates with the extent and severity of the fibrosis. It correlates with the modified rotten skin score. So these are cells we would like to uh, make disappear or turn off. Um, and so again, as far as target discovery, um, there seem to be two uh, molecules that really uh, are very potent at driving the activation of these fibroblasts into myofibroblasts and making these myofibroblasts secrete collagen. Uh, one is a cytokine called TGF-beta, the other is LPA, which our lab has been investigating. Um, and both of those uh, now have uh, therapies designed against them that are in clinical trials. Uh, for TGF-beta, there is a trial of an anti-TGF-beta antibody. Um, again, for scleroderma uh, patients, this is a phase one trial, again, just trying to look at the safety of this. Uh, but it's also going to look at one of these novel effectiveness measures. Patients are going to be have their skin biopsied before and after uh, the drug is started, and the the proteins that TGF-beta makes, that makes the fibroblast make, is going to be looked for in the skin biopsy. So again, this is a short trial, six weeks, but we're hoping uh, by doing these skin biopsies, we can really see whether this drug is working or not. Uh, the LPA1 antagonist uh, is also going to be a phase one trial, um, and it's also going to be a short-term trial. Again, since this is the first time in scleroderma patients, uh, a primary outcome is safety, uh, but they will look uh, at skin stiffness. The, the last point I want to make before summing up uh, is um, I've uh, presented five different drug trials, five different targets, not including the, the, um, the uh, uh, bone marrow transplant or hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplant trials. And you may ask, you know, are all of these uh, targets important? Uh, do we need drugs against all of them? How would I pick one versus another? It may be what we're finding, and again, in, in really seminal research, again, sponsored by the Scleroderma Research Foundation, even though skin fibrosis looks very similar in one scleroderma patient to another, the molecules that are causing the fibrosis uh, may be quite different in one patient to another. And consequently, the type of drug that's going to work in one patient may be different from the type of drug that is going to be needed by another patient. Uh, this work is really being pioneered by Michael Whitfield at Dartmouth, uh, also funded by the Scleroderma Research Foundation, and he has done very in-depth molecular analyses of skin samples of patients with scleroderma to, in a sense, make a fingerprint or really characterize all the proteins that are abnormal in the skin of scleroderma patients. And as I mentioned, they show differences. Not all scleroderma patients are the same but they don't show uh, unlimited number of differences, meaning that it's not that every single scleroderma patient is completely different from every other scleroderma patient. They basically show that there are a limited number of subsets of scleroderma patients. And within a subset, it looks like the same pathways are activated, but not across uh, uh, subsets. So it may be subset A needs a TGF-beta drug, and subset B needs an LPA drug. Um, and I think that's going to be, uh, that's a very uh, new and exciting uh, uh, area of research. 
So then, just lastly, to sum up, um, uh, I hope uh, I've been able to communicate that there have been recent advances in understanding what drives disease progression in scleroderma, uh, that this has led uh, academic centers uh, to identify new targets uh, and pharmaceutical companies to develop new drugs uh, that hit these targets that are now actually in actively enrolling clinical trials. And given all this, we have increasing optimism that we'll be able to develop uh, effective therapy for this really devastating disease. Um, and I would just really like to close uh, by thanking uh, the Scleroderma Research Foundation for many things, for the opportunity to uh, talk to you today, uh, for the funding that they've given our laboratory to do our LPA work, which we hope is going to really be helpful to patients, and just for all the funding they've given all these other researchers, because it's really a a, a team effort, a field effort, and, and things that Mike Whitfield and Hal Dietz do help us and vice versa. Uh, so it's really uh, their role in, in moving the field forward uh, has really been uh, just phenomenal. Um, and I have run a little long, but I hope we still have time uh, for questions. Great. Well, Andy, first of all, th thank you for the a great presentation, and thank you for your, for your remarks and, and, um, and your appreciation for the the funding that we've been able to provide for your lab and, and for other uh, outstanding scientists. And we're obviously very excited about the progress and um, particularly excited about having some of the foundational work that we have uh, helped support uh, be translated into uh, uh, basically strategies to address the disease that are now being tested in the clinic. So, and. And maybe with that, um, we'll t we have about uh, about 10 minutes, and I will um, field some of the questions that have come in and and uh, and relay them to you, and see if we can't involve uh, some of our audience uh, in the last uh, whatever nine or 10 minutes that we have. Um, I, maybe one of the questions is somewhat sort of fundamental, but do you want to just talk a little bit about access to clinical trials and how patients find the right trial and um, uh, you know, and then you'll go to pursue whether or not they're an appropriate candidate for it? Sure. Excellent question. So there are a number of uh, ways to get information, including the Scleroderma Research Foundation website um, that uh, keeps information on active clinical trials. Um, there are things, in addition to the Scleroderma Research Foundation website, on the web for patients to have access to. And then, of course, uh, there's uh, discussion uh, with uh, your individual rheumatologist. But the, the most complete uh, listing of clinical trials is actually uh, run uh, by uh, Department of Health and Human Services. It's a website called clinicaltrials.gov, uh, all one word, clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, and this is a searchable website uh, that basically all clinical trials are required to register with. Um, so you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and basically search scleroderma, and you will come up with, I believe right now, uh, there are 81 trials listed. Um, now, not all of them are recruiting. It will tell you which ones are actively recruiting. Uh, for the, it will also tell you whether they're for pulmonary hypertension in scleroderma, for skin fibrosis in scleroderma. It will give you basically an enormous amount of information, and it will also give you uh, either list the centers that are enrolling uh, uh, for the trial uh, or give you uh, a way to find out which centers are enrolling. Um, now, uh, so that can give you a sense of what the possibilities are. I think there's, there's, as it, it can't, so I, I encourage everyone to, to be as informed as possible. It can be a little daunting, though, to see, you know, all these different trials and then to figure out which ones I might be eligible for, which ones might be uh, more appropriate or less appropriate for me, um, and that is best discussed with your rheumatologist. Uh, if your rheumatologist is not familiar with these trials, um, you can perhaps, uh, you know, request, you know, he or she get information from uh, uh, one of the larger scleroderma uh, centers around the country, and those are also listed uh, on the scleroderma research website. Um, the uh, ultimately, to some extent, it comes down to personal preference, though. Um, 
there may be a situation where there may be a phase one trial, which is, again, the first in humans, uh, of something that looks phenomenally exciting. Um, phase one trials are, you know, potentially, you know, very exciting, but also riskier, again, since they've been, they're the first in humans. So to some extent, there is a uh, internal calculus each individual patient needs to make about would I rather be doing something at the cutting edge or would I rather wait for a phase three trial, in which case it's already been shown to be uh, safe and now we're just uh, trying to see whether it's effective. Sometimes the things that make it to phase three have already been shown to have some hints of effectiveness, which is great, although perhaps they've been demonstrated not to be the home run. So you may be a phase three trial may be safer, may have a better chance of having at least some help, but maybe not the possible, you know, uh, really a breakthrough treatment that a phase one may have. So that, so ultimately, th there is personal preference involved as well. But th there are, I'd say, between clinicaltrials.gov and your own rheumatologist or a referral to a scleroderma center, uh, those are the two obviously best places of information that you then may need to take, you know, home and really think about, gee, you know. Actually, Andy, along those lines, do you want to talk just a little bit about when people talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria, just in a word or two, like what they actually, you know, what that sure. actually means? I think we've sort of gone over it, but those, that's kind of the technical term which you see on clintrials.gov, and you can just translate that into English for Yeah, people. good point. So, right, so each trial, uh, uh, with the information that will be on the website, will be inclusion and exclusion criteria. So as you can see, a lot of the, the trials that I went over, they want patients to have, uh, they want to look at patients with diffuse uh, scleroderma. So right away, if you have localized scleroderma, that wouldn't be eligible. There are also usually age criteria. Uh, most of the clinical trials, uh, unless it's a disease specifically of children, will exclude patients less than 18. Sometimes there's older age criteria. Patients may need to be less than 70, although that's also being relaxed. Um, and then there's a lot of other exclusion criteria for other diseases. So uh, if uh, someone is unfortunate enough to have another fatal disease besides scleroderma, they may be excluded from the trial because the, the trial doesn't want to lose their patients to these other diseases. They really want them to be present for the entire duration of the trial. So there are uh, type of disease, diffuse, localized, obviously a trial with for scleroderma-related pulmonary hypertension would require patients to have pulmonary hypertension. Um, there are, there are uh, age and other uh, comorbid or uh, other disease inclusion and exclusion criteria. So those, those are the big ones, but there can be, independent on the drug, there can be individual ones if something is, uh, has a hint that it really needs a very good liver to be safely metabolized, they may really require completely normal liver function and so forth. That's great. Maybe just one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap up. It's a little bit of a, an aside and ex expands this, but uh, you referenced your own work in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and there's a lot of clinical work going on there as well. Um, would Is it a reasonable expectation, or how do you think about the crossover from treatment of IPF to the treatment of fibrosis in uh, scleroderma lung, you know, patients who've got scleroderma lung disease? I think there's going to be enormous crossover. Uh, and certainly, as, as Luke mentioned, in our uh, area of LPA1, there, uh, it turns out Bristol-Myers-Squibb is running a trial in IPF and Sanofi is running a trial in scleroderma. And both of them had a difficult time figuring out which disease to tackle first. I think there's an enormous number uh, of these mediators, TGF-beta the same, that something that looks promising in IPF is going to be very promising to try in scleroderma and vice versa. There are some differences. For instance, we know that cyclophosphamide uh, was effective at at least temporarily improving lung function in patients with scleroderma uh, lung fibrosis. That is the same class of drugs that in the trial I showed where uh, therapy was actually harmful in IPF, that kind of anti-inflammatory therapy was actually harmful in IPF. So there are drugs that may be uh, good in one and bad in the other, or good in one and not work in the other, but I think the majority of these new targets uh, are going to 
uh, either work in both or, or, or not work in both together. So I think there's going to be an awful lot of helpful crossover uh, between the research fields. Well, that's a very exciting. So we've got a lot to keep our eye on, both in the scleroderma-specific trials as well as in IPF and, and maybe in, uh, in some of the other autoimmune uh, clinical work that's being done as well. And uh, with that, um, we're just about out of time. I'd like to once again thank uh, Dr. Tager for his time and also thank all of you for, for joining us today. Uh, we're all part of a growing scleroderma community, so um, please, uh, you can provide valuable information back to the SRF by completing a very short survey when you close out uh, from the webinar today. Um, also in closing, I remind you that we do depend on your support to continue our investment in the most promising research aimed at discovering new treatments and a cure for scleroderma. Please do visit us online at www.sclerodermaresearch.org or, of course, at any time, call our offices 1-800-441-CURE. That's 1-800-441-2873. Thank you again. Goodbye for today. Stand by.